ladies and gentlemen, Barstool Backstage and on the guest list this week, we have the singer of Rise Against, a fucking legend, a Chicago legend. Mm -hmm. We got Tim from Rise Against on the podcast. Tim, how are you, brother? Hey, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for playing golf with White Sox. Dave, Dave, you want to explain how this came together? <laughs> yeah, so so Tim and I have a mutual friend, Scott Darling, a good friend of mine, lives down the street, uh, won a Stanley Cup with the Hawks. Uh, I work very closely with Wishfest, a great charity in the Chicagoland area where um, all the proceeds that they raise, it goes directly to families battling cancer. It's one of my favorite things that I'm involved with. And they have a little golf scramble every year. And I hit up Scott, who's like, I'm like, hey, I got one. Bring whoever you want. And Tim, by far the better golfer. Well, we'll <laughs> and the rest is history. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I feel like just you're really bad, dude. Yeah. <laughs> the bar may have been low. I'm, I got to qualify, too. Like, I'm like, a, I'm a COVID golfer. So I never golfed, like, before COVID. It was like. It was the middle of shutdown. Nothing was open except for golf courses. And I was like, all right, I'm going to start to figure out how to do this. So but I, I, was happy. I had a lot of fun with those guys. You have a putting green behind you. <laughs> I know. This is me trying to practice. <laughs> oh, you got in heavy during COVID. You started golfing, dude. That's the thing, too. You could take the clubs on tour. Have you done that yet? You know, I was just on the road with uh, some friends of ours in a band called Silverstein. And yeah. they've got that whole program down. Like, they've got three or four guys in the band that golf. They're like, they're waking up early. They got these funky outfits, like yeah. they're finding the golf course and they're, I need, I don't have anybody in my band that golfs yet. I need to like recruit a few guys and like try to get them into the cult of golf. I've got a couple of crew guys that golf, but they have to work all day. And yeah. <laughs> so I need Dude, to golfing find on tour. Golfing on tours and Aaron golfs a ton. So did Drew, our golf, our guitar player, but like from the 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 road and the drinking and the sleeping and the hotels and the this and that to put on like a polo shirt some slacks go out in nature have a whiskey hit the ball with your friends like it's kind of a really good therapeutic on tour thing yeah i'm definitely jealous of the tour golfers i want to get in on it i want to like bring some clubs and have somebody out there to like go with because i think it is like a perfect thing to do before a show because you have these long days that you kind of got to entertain yourself you know, until the show happens, you know, and that seems like the perfect way to do it and a way to see some beautiful parts of the world. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, it's not only that. It's like you live a nocturnal lifestyle to actually get out and get some like vitamin D before a show. You actually feel like a human being. Absolutely. Yeah. Like just we live in these dark dressing rooms like all day long. And so you try to find somewhere to just kind of feel normal for a second before you like you said, like it's a nighttime thing. You know what I mean? Like we're not going on stage till 10 o'clock at night sometimes. So like your days can be really long unless you find ways to like entertain yourself. Yeah. Are you I mean, you've been... of any uh, country clubs out here? Do you What's got that? a home course? Do you got a home course in Chicago? No, I kind of just play where anybody will adopt me and take me along with them and let me cruise around. But I have gotten lucky and I've been to North Shore. I've been to Westmoreland. I've been to River Forest through like a few friends of friends kind of thing. Yeah. But mostly I just play like the public courses, like you know. And just play with like some friends. I'm like, I'm not at a point where I'm confident enough to play with strangers yet. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm like, oh no, gotta... no, 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 no. I I saw you golf. You can you get up and down the course just fine. All right, it's I'll not take you're that. not a scratch golfer by any means. You get up and yeah. down the course just fine. But you have you a get... name behind you too, so it kind of sucks if it's like, yo, the guy from Rise Against jumped on our foursome and he fucking sucked. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, like that's that kind of that story is very probable. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how I feel like, unless I'm going to wear some shades and a dark hat and try to like, you know, play off like I'm not me, but you know, I don't have any shame in my game either, you know? And that's the one thing I guess you guys all golf. Everybody golfs here. I, I, yeah. I okay. golf a handful of times a year. And that's one of them that Keep the clubs go. next to me during the podcast, <laughs> brother, just in case <laughs> you find like, you find that everyone's cool out there. Nobody's expecting you to like, you know, change the world with your game. And that's kind of, you know, I, I, I love it. I actually, I'm getting way into it and I'm getting past the rookie stage where I don't have like the rookie word to like cover up my poor game. I need to start like figuring shit out, you know, but I'm starting to, I'm starting to. Have you started to watch a lot of golf? Uh, no, I haven't crossed over until I haven't found that interesting yet. I yeah, like, I right. do find those people absolute superheroes now that I know like how hard it is to do, you know? Yeah. Um, but what oh, I think what I like, freaks. Golf, oh, total freaks, total yeah, freaks, freaks. Unbelievable. And just like the, uh, like the mental game that it takes to, mm -hmm. to put that together. 
And those are some of like the parallels that I see with like, I guess doing anything, but for me, I do a band and I sing on stage and it really is like, it's a mental game that you play with yourself to hold it together to complete that show, you know, or to complete that song or whatever. And so I saw a lot of parallels like, oh, golf has that kind of same thing. You got to, if you get in your own head, you're going to choke. You know what I mean? If you overthink it, you're going to botch this swing. You know what I mean? You got to kind of let yourself go. And there was a lot of, I feel like I learned a lot like about, about those parallels. I think both things kind of helped me do each side of like my personality. It is funny to hear a guy who plays to a hundred thousand people a year and has a 20 year successful, wildly successful career, being nervous to go out and do something. You know what I mean? Like, it's just funny. Like the thing you'll stand in front of fucking 10,000 people a night and then get on the golf course and be like, Oh my God, I can't Dude, do this. Like, that's easy. <laughs> Dude, right. I mean, te- teeing off in front of other grown men on that first hole. Right. That's there's like nothing. There's nothing more emasculating than than like just like completely fucking up a drive, right? And it's just that dudes is the behind most horrifying you. Fine thing on earth. It really is. Yeah. And like you didn't warm up. You you showed up late. You know, there's a bunch of dudes behind you, and they're just watching you. Especially <laughs> and you're and you're going last. Yeah. And everybody else just crushed it. Yeah. Like if you ever want to feel like what it feels like to be like on a stage for a second, like that's kind of what it feels like. Like it's pretty, you, you're just an adrenaline junk. You needed something to mimic the feeling of being afraid to fuck up a show during COVID. So you got into golfing just so people could judge you. Can I parallel this <laughs> back into the music like for that. a second that like, I've seen you play on stage with just you and an acoustic guitar. And mm. I, any musician will tell you that's one of the most difficult possible things that you, that you can do. So, I mean, just, just cra- it's crazy how one thing could be comfortable and another one could be like, eh. I know. I think it's like, you have to be like a little bit dumb to walk out there and do that. And that's me. Oh, I'm, a, yeah. a little bit, I'm a little bit dumb enough to walk out there with a guitar and be like, wait, you're, you're going to walk out there with just you and a guitar for like yeah. people and you're going to entertain them? Like, yeah, <laughs> Let, let's see this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Watch this one, boys. But no, I mean, that, that parallel, now that I think about it, that's probably true. Like I'm, I'm watching, I got the White Sox game on in the background right now. And I've met a bunch of these guys and they're all kind of dumb. Yeah. Best on earth and what they do, you know, right. not by major league yeah. standards, but your point is well taken. I don't have any scientific evidence to back it up, but I feel like you got to be a little bit naive of the risk that you're taking a little bit aloof to the risk that you're taking. I went, I went downhill mountain biking with a friend of mine in Colorado and, you know, I live here in Chicago, so there's not a lot of downhill mountain biking happening here, you know? So yeah. it, was, it was new to me, right? It was new to me. And it's dangerous, too. Like, you dress up like a stormtrooper. You go to the top of, like, Breckenridge, and then you just bomb this hill. It's it's you got to be a little bit stupid to do it. And he was worried about me, but we did a few runs, and it all worked out. And he wouldn't say this to my face, but he told this to my wife because she was like, how did he do? And she's like, you know, Tim did fine. He kept up with all of us that are out here. I think Tim's just a little dumb enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, irrational confidence comes off as stupidity yeah, yeah. from time to time. But you're just irrationally co- – to do what we do, and especially what you do at the level you do it, you have to be a little bit irrationally confident. Yeah. And not cocky, but just be like, yeah, I can do that. Why not? Yeah, just like you're just like a little bit maybe purposely, purposefully unaware of the risks you are taking. You right. know what I mean? Yes. Like, Let me ask you this on that note. Um, like any athlete, any golfer, any basketball player, Michael Jordan missed shots, Tiger Woods is duffed tee shots, whatever. You fuck up on stage. Every musician's done. I'm not a musician, obviously. I'm sure every musician fucks up regularly on stage. No one's perfect. What do you like? How do you mask that? Oh man, you overcompensate with like a smile. <laughs> <laughs> and like you overcompensate. Like you just you because you have two like options you could just like put your tail between your legs and just let the nerves show and people are like oh man that guy's scared yeah. or you do something to like overcompensate for your mistake like hey what's up chicago how we doing <laughs> <laughs> how do you forget about that you know <laughs> like do you have a big like your big i have a biggest fear on stage and it's that my gear stops working like that that the pedal board goes out or like a cord shorts out and i have to like fumble around like a fucking idiot to try and get my shit to work again do you have like forgetting words to a song or do you have like a fear that you obviously don't have a fear that people aren't going to show up because they're going to show up. But like, what's your biggest thing going into a show? Yeah, I just, I know like as a singer, I know that like my voice is anchoring the show. You know what I mean? And so 
and it's not a piece of gear. You know what I mean? So I can't just replace it, <laughs> you know, <if> it, <laughs> batteries. And so that's my thing every day. I like, I check in with myself. I'm like, you're good. Are we good? Like you're going to pull this off, you know? And you know, every day, you know, for the most part, that answer is yes. But I, but I try not to think too much about that. The show relies on that, you know, right. happen, you know? Um, and so that's why my biggest fear is to like, have something happen where it's like, oh, this thing isn't working right now. It wasn't down in Houston, uh, like two weeks ago. Was it? It was, was Morgan it, Wallen or Morgan? Was, it was Morgan Wallen. He's yeah, never Morgan Wallen. Anything good. Right. Um, what hypothetically? How would you have handled that? Did you see that? He had to cancel the show like five minutes before he was supposed to stay, take stage. Dude, I felt so bad for him. Like I feel bad for anytime I see that story with a singer, I feel so bad because I think that is. That is my worst nightmare. I think it's probably any singer's worst nightmare. Um, and I know, I don't know, but I'm I'm ninety percent sure I know the exact scenario he was dealing with because I I've dealt with it too, where like you're aware that like you're sick or maybe like you have swollen vocal cords or there's something that's beyond your control that you mm -hmm. can't just massage your way out of it. You know what I mean? But you've done some damage. You're sick, whatever it is, and then you have to tell yourself, "Yo, do I tell somebody about this?" Mm -hmm. like, do I do I do I pull oh, yeah. the plug here? Do I raise the red flag and say, "Yo, I got something going on here," and then shut down a show? And for an artist that size, it's a really massive show, right? It's like a whole a that was small, a stadium show. Dude, it's like a small country's economy to have that yep. show. Like that could wipe out the profit from his tour, maybe. And then, so you're in denial. You know, you're saying, "I got this. I could yeah. do this." You know, I, and then you don't tell anybody. And the crowd rolls in, they park their car, they get their popcorn, they buy some merch and the beer next thing, you know, they're in the place. And like, there's just, you missed that window to cancel, you know, now it, the doors are open. A stadium costs a million dollars to open, just open the doors, no matter what happens, you know? And so you just more and more pressure. And, uh, you know, there's nights where I felt like I wanted to cancel five minutes before, you know? And so for him to do that, it must've been felt like he really had to do it. And that's like, I felt for him there. And anytime I see a story like that, I feel for those singers because I feel like we've all been there. Absolutely. I got to, I'm going to go, I got a question. Uh, yeah. And this is going to geek out a little bit because I started with you and Baxter. I was a huge Baxter fan. Oh, whoa, we're going back. All right, <laughs> Kenny. Back, right. And then it was the killing tree for me. Holy uh, shit. Right. And then you get into like the unraveling and revolutions per minute and stuff. And my, my, my point is that your voice has always had this rasp to it. I mean, whether you're screaming too, because I've heard you scream hardcore. Was that something that you had to learn to manage to do night after night how did you learn to manage yeah. ma manage it or is like your voice is just so naturally raspy when you sing even when you're singing slower songs is it just something that was natural to you and it's never been like a learning curve yeah that's a good question uh, so i'm untrained like I, I didn't take any vocal lessons Fuck yeah like pretty much actually i started meeting with a coach just in the last couple of years of my life you know like after i turned 40 like i started meeting with somebody to kind of pop the hood and like how does this thing work but for the most part, this is voice cracks. Um, yeah, my voice cracks. <laughs> back, <right? laughs> it's always a process, right? Just like golf, it's always a process. Like you're gonna shank, you're gonna shank some. Um, but it was natural. I didn't try to do anything except for maybe like emulate my favorite singers. You know what I mean? Like growing up. Um, but for, and honestly, when I think about how I developed like how to sing, it mostly came from like the circumstances of like I was put in as every band is putting, you're probably in a garage or a basement or a room like we're all in. Um, you got a drummer, you got a guitar player, you got a bass player. Um, nobody really has money for like a PA. Yeah. No right? earplugs in sight either. Oh, oh no. A PA is such like an extraneous expense that who yeah. wants to go spend like 500 bucks on a PA? So, you, so you're probably singing with a Radio Shack mic plugged into your guitar player's first amplifier that yeah. you don't want to place, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that thing, as you know, is not loud enough, right? So you're cranking it and everyone's playing as loud as they can. And you're singing and you want to hear yourself and you want other people to hear what you're doing. And so for me, I'm I'm singing on like 11, you know, I'm just like going for it because I just want the room to hear me. I just want to hear what the sound sounds like. And I feel like that's what I did from like 14 years old on. I just sang my ass off into a microphone. And so it was the only way I knew how to sing was just just it, just as as ferocious as possible, and then I later on, organically trained your voice, just you know, by doing what you do. I should have just blown it. Like it's just there's no reason why <laughs> I'm still talking to you. You know, like it's just it's That's like kind of a miracle. Yeah. Like I did all the wrong things, 
and some of my voice um was able to kind of just take it you know and then i started to figure out the nuance of it all you know and i started to figure out a little bit more how to sing the microphones got better the mm-hmm. headphones got better we got into a studio somebody told me i was flat or sharp you know and i wanted it i wanted it to sound better and then i got i think i got really lucky and then i started to figure out how to sing um early in our career as like the world gave me a few passes on my early stuff you know what i mean when i was still very like if i was like to be thrown on to like uh you know one of the one of the i can't even think of like but one of the like the competitor shows where a singer tries to like sing his ass off or her ass off i would have you know i've been a failure at 17 you know but luckily i grew up in a punk and hardcore scene where like we let each other learn and grow and play stuff that was raw mm-hmm. and i got a pass on my early years and i was able to learn how to sing i think just on my own later on can i geek out more I got more. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I saw, so just speaking that you're talking about your earlier days and all that stuff. I saw you guys play. The first time I saw you guys play was in 2003 in Orlando when you guys had Avenged Sevenfold opening up for you. Uh, I, you were going so far back. This is I, I know. I, that, that's what, like, it means a lot. You yeah. mean a lot to me. And, and the, the geek part of it was that like revolutions per minute had just changed my mind completely about what I wanted to do. Then I got to see you guys play back then and so it's such a huge reason that i even play music in the first place was being inspired by the shit that you were doing especially in those early days where you were just like it was so raw and it was so ruthless and it was beautiful it was beautiful dude those days were so much fun it's funny because i really i remember those days more than i remember like two years ago you know because those when when you're touring in a van with you and avenge sevenfold and shy halud yep yep exactly um where did you see the show did you say where you see the show uh orlando at the social my god i totally remember that yeah yeah. like i do that night i got uh avenge seven volts two song cassette sampler for awakening fallen yeah and there was a guy selling hot dogs out front after the show right every time yes sir you have like veggie dogs i mean fuck if i don't say it all the time that's a beautiful part about music for me personally that show 20 years later sticks out in my mind like that. I know exactly what, how I felt, you know, it's incredible. Dude, I can, it's so funny. Cause you know, those shows back then, it would really, you were kind of like blazing this trail as a band. Every, every show was different. Every, every venue was new. Every show was a kind of a struggle to get to and on stage, like later in life. Now our shows are kind of like very similar venues, you know, we're on a bus. Our days look very much like groundhog day. So I don't remember a lot of the shows the last few years. Cause they, cause they all kind of blend into one. But each one of those shows you're talking about, like those oh, are unique. Yeah. Like I remember the social. I remember that crowd. I remember how hot it was in there. You yes. know, I remember downtown Orlando, you know, like holy shit, those shows Dude, were that was crowd. really beautiful right there. Yeah, it's but so cool. How everything to... came full circle. It's so cool. well, it's like I, at that time I played in a four-piece punk rock band listening to 88 Fingers Louis and Lawrence Arms and like everything that you guys came from is what was in my CD book. And so, yeah, it's just fucking beautiful. <laughs> What's so cool to me is listening to this conversation and, and Tim, the way you're talking about it, it reminds me of like just the like innovation and the realization that like the early poverty days of being a musician will breed. So you're saying you came up and learned how to sing because the fucking PA didn't exist. You had to sing through an amp. And you remember the days where you had to grind it out and play in small venues and sweat it out. But when you get to a certain level, that all feels like Groundhog's Day. It's such a beautiful fucking thing about this whole process. It really is. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of awesome. I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest. You know, the way it all kind of unfolded and happened. Like, I think we needed to be who we were in 2003 and earlier than that, even. We needed to figure out the kind of band we were, the, the venues we were playing we were we were not ready for any sort of limelight when we first started and we grew up in a scene that allowed us to figure it out that yeah. allowed us to like they didn't just put us on like jimmy kimmel and be like okay do this impress yeah. everybody now you know instead yeah. it was like we were able to craft what we do you know what i mean like or work on our craft until until we were ready for like a bigger crowd like it took us a couple of years we weren't it wasn't out the gate overnight success you know and i want to change that did you expect that success though, knowing that it was going to be a grind? No, I feel like, I don't know. Like, I feel like back then when you start a punk band and like, you know, the year 2000 around there, like punk wasn't this like mainstream thing that was happening. And so right. it wasn't the genre you might get into if you were trying to be successful, you know, it was that's for fucking sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was still like kind of a black sheep. There was still a lot of like 
new metal on the radio maybe you know and like big rock stuff but like yeah, fuck, that was like new that was like the new metal times around then i got another this is not a uh <laughs> not a new question but an actual music question because Yo, tim kenny hates everybody he's everybody fucking in love with you man he's fucking <laughs> in love with you i can you see know, the little like rosy kenny. cheeks he's got when you when you when you can so definitively point to why you do what you do me in this case it's uh, i mean i don't think a lot of people necessarily get that privilege like i work every day with a guy named ryan green who used to engineer all the fat records absolutely i know ryan green he's a legend right, right? and so like i told ryan i was like you're, right you're the reason i play music anyway all right i, I don't want to be the obsessive weirdo but i did have a question about you know i was so deeply invested in your band around those years the unraveling revolutions per minute and then songs of the siren culture which was the first major label release and so I, I had the same uh anti-flag i did a record with them and i asked them the same question of like what's that pressure of a punk rock fucking band to be blast onto the major label circuit with dreamworks and then second question you guys did it it worked like wh what is all that like was that uh, pressure like that's what i'm curious about yeah i'm sure for everyone it's different for us we were just because we came from a punk scene we walked into all of it like middle fingers up you know what I mean? yeah, right. yeah like when you watch like the way kurt cobain dealt with success right. he just like hated everything it just was like he was a middle finger to every camera that was put in his face to every interview he ever did and we kind of walked in for better or for worse you know it's probably a little juvenile now but like we walked in like this this isn't our world these aren't our people like sure they like us now but they're gonna they're gonna toss us next year the way they do every other band so we walked in kind of middle fingers up, you know what I mean? And just like our own little unit and assuming that this mainstream world would have been there. It's time with us would eventually be done. They'd be done with us and they would, you know, cast us aside. And so, but in that we kind of found our own identity and our own personality and our own fans, right. Who, who, you know, connected with our songs. And then it was like, Oh, this, these crowds aren't getting smaller. They're getting bigger. Like these, and this, this label is not rejecting us. Like, they, they're signing us to a five record deal and we're going to do all five albums on that record on that deal in the, in the next 10 years, you know? And I think that we had a very lucky career in that sense that we were able to do what we do. Um, I never submitted a demo to any label ever. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Like we, when we delivered a song to a label, it was a finished product, right. you know? Right. And so I know that's not the experience that every band has. So I feel very lucky that we had that experience. Even bands on our own did, label didn't have that. You guys experience. also did the grind. I watched you on the grind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. To, to, in order to get to a place like DreamWorks. And I guess my last part of that question is like, was there, did you feel any more pressure from maintaining the punk rock fan base, right? With whatever the requirements were coming from the label? Or mm -hmm. was there more pressure pressure being in the major label system of like, I have all these people looking over us and now I have to meet these deadlines. And I like, you know, it becomes kind of a job, a business essentially at some point. Was there like, was there a crazy pressure with the crowd, the fans or with the label on the business side? You know, I never felt any pressure from the label. We had a really good manager, her right. name was Missy and she really kept us like insulated from the whole Hollywood world. I think, you know, a lot of it was just staying here in Chicago. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I could see that. We signed yeah, a dream. Never, never left home. We were left home. We like we signed to DreamWorks, and everyone's like, "You got to go to Hollywood now, dude." And I'm like, "I'm not going to Hollywood. Like, yeah. I got everything I need here." Oh, I love you, dude. <laughs> Colin uh, refuses to leave. I refuse Philly. to leave Philadelphia because fuck yeah. that. Why would I? Right. Yeah. No, Philly's great. Right. Yeah. I love Philly. I mean, I, I would easily take was... that as part of a a variable for success of like staying rooted. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I wanted to bring that up too. Is just like kind of a a thing. Kenny kind of covered the question, but. Did it ever shock you being that you guys got this success on alternative radio and things like that? Like you like Kenny, I, every time I turned on radio one four five Philadelphia, it was either fucking sale by AWOL nation or it was a rise against song. Like That's for the true. fact that you, you didn't change who you were and you didn't change. You wouldn't, you weren't afraid to sing about human injustice or, or sing about what you cared about, which I always fucking love that you never shorted out on what you wanted to say. And it was believable. I actually believe that you cared about what you're talking about. Did it ever shock you the success commercially that came with that? Like you didn't have to switch up and start singing love songs. Yeah, that's a good point. That did shock us. We didn't think that we'd be the one to like make the cut. You know, we signed in the same years, like Thursday, thrice, yep. Poison the Well, yellow card, uh, the used, 
those were all our peers, right? Everybody signed to a major label. Jimmy World, mm -hmm. AFI, um, Sparta at the drive-in, yep. like saves the day. Like we're all getting signed to a major label like around that time. We were actually one of the last. So like we were like, I think we were an afterthought for the labels. And when I, and when I said, and when I looked at that roster that I just listed, I was like, yo, these bands are going to make it. I can see all these bands making it. I don't think we're going to be the last one standing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that we're going to be the ones to make it, but these guys are going to make it. And so when the success came our way, you know what I mean? And when some of those bands that I just mentioned got dropped or their albums, you know, didn't do well or the labels like, you know, got shuffled up and they got screwed or whatever. I didn't think that we'd still be there grinding away on a five album deal that the label just kept green lighting every album. Like it, I, I, I thought that we were a bit of the black sheep. I didn't anticipate that we'd be the ones because we weren't, we weren't trying, we weren't trying to do anything to get there, but it was just happening. You know, like the crowds kind yeah, of came. Like, that's why I feel like it, it, it worked. I mean, if you want my opinion of why you guys are the last guys, <laughs> Let's do it, yeah. um, well, you know, again, coming as a fan, a lot of bands progress thrice progress. They're a good example of like how their records progressed into not necessarily something different, but just something. They just get better every year, man. That's what yeah, I think. hundred percent. And that was the same for me with rise against where like, I never lost rise against. I just ended up hearing kind of like better songwriting. If that's a better, if that's a, a good way to put it. Um, and a lot of the other bands that you listed were kind of a niche thing. I love them. I grew up with them. Those are my bands. Right. But you guys, you didn't adapt. You just grew, I guess, in an organic way. And, and I can, I can absolutely see why you guys are one of the last punk rock 2000 bands standing, putting out new records and playing massive shows. I can, maybe I'm a fan. <laughs> I mean, listen, there's a lot of shit that's just out of our control too. I mean, like we, I don't think we worked any harder than all those bands I just listed. They all worked hard. They all wrote great songs. Some of the best records of our generation came out from the bands I just listed. And then there's a lot of shit. that's just out of our control. We right, just, yep. put our, we put our shit out there into the ether and yeah. you know, maybe people get it and maybe they don't, you know, and, um, do you uh do you guys do you realize that you guys write perfect music for high school football weight rooms? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was my that was my I I want to kill somebody. I'm gonna throw. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. I'm dead seriously uh, thinking back field. to high school oh, yeah. weight room, and I remember fucking rise against being heavy on there. I've I've heard that it's a lot. It's a big, it's big workout music. So yes. yeah. yeah. Well, I'll take it. Yeah. Go back and listen to Killing Tree, man. That shit'll make you break everything in the room, dude. Uh, you were on the Never Back Down soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Holy we were on a, fuck. Which is the best bad best movie, bad movie. Of all time. Yes. And we were on the best bad part of it. It was like the 80s montage, the yes. teen montage, you know. They kind of, I don't know how that happened. They picked kind of a an obscure song, not an obscure, but it wasn't like a radio hit or anything and they were like, "We'll do this." And we're like, "Yo, yeah, okay." <laughs> I still live to that soundtrack from time to time. Dude, dude, I swear to god. <laughs> My favorite movie placement is um there was that movie The, the Orphan with like this yeah, yeah. girl that's a horror a, movie right yeah horror movie right there's I think a I've seen it. where like the brother's playing guitar hero or something like that and our song is the song he's playing <laughs> and the dad comes in and goes turn that shit off you you guys have just had such an impressive career from the fact that I didn't grow up with the same way that Kenny did, where he knew you back at Baxter and, and watched it come up. Yeah. I caught you guys when you were already big. Right. And but I've always respected from a songwriter's perspective and from a musician's perspective of standing your ground and making the music and writing the lyrics that you want to make and saying, fuck it. And then it works. It, it, I will always have respect for you for that. I appreciate that. Did you grow up in Philly? Born and raised. I love Philly, man. There's so many good punk bands come out, like Kid Dynamite and None More Black. Um, Ink and Dagger was Philly. You guys had the Trocadero, right? Like, yeah. Did you? So did you, when you were touring early, did you ever play Kung Fu Necktie? Oh, I don't think we played Kung Fu Necktie. Dude, when you come to Philly next, just go to Kung Fu Necktie. It's underneath the L in Whoa. fucking between Fishtown and Kensington. It looks like somewhere out of a fucking horror movie. But it right. is the best little punk venue in the world. It's the shit, dude. It's disgusting, and I love it. Is the uh, Electric Factory still there? It's called the Franklin Music Hall now. The Bowery Presents bought it. Okay, cool. And yeah. then, but then there's that river river walk thing. That river, the big stage on the river. Uh, BB and T Pavilion. It's it used to be called the the fucking Tweeter Center, and then it was the. It's been a different a uh, bunch of different banks. Right. Like, cool. spot. We, we always go to like uh, Blackbird and get the vegan Philly cheesesteaks. Is that place still there? 
Yeah. I'm sure, dude. First of all, I don't know anything about a vegan cheesesteak. You're talking to the wrong guy. But I are you a vegan? A uh, vegetarian. Yeah. You would be a vegetarian, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, you don't look 40 is what I will say. I appreciate that. You guys have a great radio DJ in Philly, uh, Pierre Robert. Oh, Pierre is my we played uh WMMR's 50th anniversary show with Bon Jovi, my band did. And I got to sing on stage at a stadium, happy birthday to Pierre Robert. And it is one of my greatest memories as a human being. That's incredible. What band do you play with? Uh, it's called Foxtrot and The Get Down. Awesome. That's Soon cool. to be the biggest band in the world if I have anything to do with it. I love that. It's you so know, um, uh, well, Dave Haas. You know Dave Haas? Yeah, Dave there. Haas is playing a festival in my neighborhood in two weeks. Nice. Yeah. Dave Haas is the fucking man, dude. He is the fucking man. Yeah, and he's doing that festival. Speaking of twins, Dave Haas has twins too. Really? Is he alive? There's a whole yeah, Dave. <laughs> Dave's as of today. As of today, he's still alive. Just like pump out fucking yeah. twins. We're right. busy fucking, that. dude. Unlike you, Dave. Yeah, yeah, Dave. You need to score out some kids. Hey, by the way, this absolutely murders me that I have to leave. But Tim, it was so good seeing you. Yeah. And I gotta say one last thing because I love to geek out before I leave. On a ba- in a band that's on the come up, you start to play with your peers, right? And play with bigger bands and so on and so forth. We played with you guys in like Tulsa somewhere. And it was the first time I heard anybody ever say that I cared about say, give it up for AWOL Nation. And it's so stupid how that sounds, but you were the first person I cared about that ever said that on stage. Mm-hmm. And again, you just have these memories and it means a lot that I got to talk to you again. I do have to leave. It was so good to see you. And I hope I see you again soon. Oh, you too, Kenny. Yeah. I mean, AWOL, great. Aaron, great. He comes from that punk and hardcore scene. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> which is why, which is why, like, I always thought as an alternative band who had a singer that came from punk and hardcore, we were always the most exciting band at a lot of these shows because he had the scream and all this stuff. And, like, yeah. same, same, man. Same vibe. Same love. Yeah, this was a it. love fest. This was great. I told you I was excited about this, man. I'm a big Rising Against fan. <laughs> I appreciate that, Kenny. I'll see you soon, brother. All right, cool, man. All right, I mean, cool. Tim, on that note, we're going to let you go, man, because we've kept you about an hour. Um, do you guys have anything coming up? So we are, are starting to focus on our 10th album, actually. Wow. So, 10? We, yeah, we toured like the shit out of the last couple of years, um, and we'll start working on the next album. We will play the Rock and Ring, Rock and Park Festival with the Foo Fighters in Germany at Hell the yeah. end of the month. We will play the the um, When We Are Young Festival in Vegas in the fall. We will play um, the Blue Ridge Mountain Fest and also in the fall. But mostly we're focusing on a record. And then we'll be in Australia with Blink um, next. I saw that, yeah. <clears throat> um, which we can cut this part, but um, the golf event we did last summer, that was through a charity. I just talked to the guy. I'm like, I'm recording Tim McElrath because they just, they can't get a hold of Goo Goo Dolls who was supposed to do it. They agreed to it. Didn't sign the dotted line. Would you guys do it? It's a hometown thing. Oh, I mean, we and, they, and they, and they pay for it. I mean, I, oh. I don't, I don't know what you guys charge. That's not my business to talk numbers, but um, I do know they got X ambassadors, 75 grand, but there's a radius clause. So they couldn't. Yeah. So I know Sam from X ambassadors. Um, yeah, I could give you like my manager's info and like, you know, I'm booked by the same woman who books a wall actually. So, oh okay. shit. Which is my I can say oh. I've played, I played the festival. Yeah. It's fucking uh, awesome. It's fantastic. It, we raised about a half mil for a cancer, uh, cancer benefit. So it seems like a great organization. Um, for sure. I mean, but yeah, would love to consider playing it. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to make it put pressure on you. Just, uh, I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to play Chicago, especially if it's like a benefit. You know what I mean? I yeah, gotta, yeah. like I gotta I gotta wrangle a bunch of troops to make it happen, but like like stranger things have happened. I do love Dave being like, I'm not trying to put any pressure on you. No, but I I'm really, not. For I'm really not. But like <laughs> if interested, you can tell me to fuck off right now. I'll just be like, hey, he uh, can't they're booked or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I, I can't sing any Johnny Resnick songs though, so I hope they're not expecting we, we just had him on the podcast last week. Yeah, he was on last <laughs> we week. Johnny on the podcast last week. I guess yeah. I guess they just like started ghosting ghosting them. Oh, you should have told me. I would have slapped him in the dick. Dude. I didn't know until today. <laughs> I didn't know until today. Huh. Oh god. I met I've met Johnny. Johnny actually helped me with doing the national anthem for the Chicago White Sox. 
Yeah, he did that uh, like two years ago, right? Yeah, and like I did it once, and like it went fine, but I was like, that, so that's nervous. Cool. And oh, I'm sure. Yeah, it's a little change of pace. Well, I do have to ask you. I do have to ask you. Where do your Chicago sports allegiances lie? A White Sox fan. At a boy. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. If you're no anything like this fucking guy, are we still winning, Dave? Are we winning tonight? Oh, uh, uh, they're tied now. It's four to four. Okay. Um, Arlington be- Heights is weirdly. That's where he grew up, the north northwest side of Chicago. It's weirdly yeah. got a lot of Sox fans. I feel like. I guess. I guess so. I never thought about that, but yeah, like. Yeah, I guess so. And like my kids kind of grew up Sox fans too, and and so they got to like bear the the brunt of you know yeah. <laughs> of being of being a Sox fan. You know, like Dad, why are we Sox fans? Like that's the, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's so, exactly. And here, I feel like you could, as a touring musician who's probably been to Philly a million times, getting to know Colin and a few guys I work with at Barstool from uh, Philadelphia. I've only been to like downtown Philly. I've never really explored the city. I think Northeast Philly and the South side of Chicago are literally carbon copies of each other, just based on the type of people they are. Would oh, you agree with that? Yeah. Not, I mean, I've not spent enough time, but I've always felt like Philly was like a, like a sister city though. I've always it, felt it seriously. Very is. It really is. I felt very comfortable in Philly. Like I felt, I always enjoy my time there. Um, I've got a lot of, a lot of great bands and good friends from Philly. So it always felt cool. If the south side of Chicago is the kind of place where you can get punched in the face outside of a 7-Eleven, but then I'll pick you up and buy you a beer, then yeah, it sounds like it's probably the same place. We definitely, one of our first shows in Philadelphia, we stayed in a neighborhood that was like less than awesome. And we made one of our guys sleep in the van that night, like out in the streets. We're like, this thing needs to be here in the morning. So you're you're staying out here. (laughs) <laughs> Good move. City hasn't changed at all. I want you to know that. It's the same place, no, but hey, I love it. Big cities, big problems. That's how it goes. You know yeah. what I mean? But you take the good with the bad. There's nothing like listening to some fucking loser from Arkansas be like, these big cities, they're just crime ridden. It's like, dude, there's seven people in your town. What do you think <laughs> is what do you think the difference is? Right. We are a massive metropolitan area. Of course, there's weird shit that goes on here. But you take the good with the bad. Yeah, yeah. That's how, that's how we move. That's what creates weird shit, is like just all the the people and the weirdness and the, you know, that's where the cool stuff comes from too. So yeah, it's hard, it's hard to compare cities anyway. So uh, fuck Arkansas. <laughs> that's me <laughs> saying that. Not you, uh, Tim, this has been an absolute pleasure. Your seat is always open when I'm in Chicago. Let's yeah. get two okay golfers together and we'll go hit some fucking balls around, dude. I love, I love that plan. That's what we'll, we'll call our podcast that two okay golfers. Yeah. Two okay golfers, one who can sing and one who can't. That's it. The full name of the podcast, dude. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, Tim, everyone go see uh, Rise Against on the Road. Go stream all their music. Get ready for a new album. Tim, you're the man. Thank you so much, brother. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.